Well, let's get underway. Good evening, everyone. I'm Scott Newton. I'm reader in Laws of Central Asia here at SOAS and director of the Center for Contemporary Central Asia and the Caucasus. And it's a pleasure to welcome you here tonight to the Anthony Hyman Lecture um, to be delivered by Dr. Rosala Ashraf Neymat. This is the 17th lecture in the series, which is dedicated to the memory of an extraordinary scholar and an extraordinary individual, renowned not just for his Afghan and wider Central Asian regional expertise, expertise which was political, cultural, linguistic, and historical, but renowned as well for his remarkable personal qualities, which were equally diverse and humane, his ethics, his politics, and his years of activism, the model of a thoroughly engaged and thoroughly engaging scholar. Anthony was, of course, a proud son of SOAS, and so the lecture series was launched here at SOAS in his honor by his many friends, stalwarts, colleagues, and admirers. We have been gratified over the years to have invited to address this gathering more SOAS-affiliated and SOAS-produced speakers, as well as an occasional Afghan national. I cannot tell you how pleased, how chuffed we are here tonight. I speak for the center the school, the Development Studies Department, and a number of my SOAS colleagues in our personal and professional capacities to welcome for the first time to this series a daughter of SOAS and a daughter of Afghanistan, a notable scholar of Afghanistan in all senses and a SOAS PhD as well. So this is a particularly auspicious occasion and I want you all to note it. Rosala's life experiential CV is as significant and vital to an appreciation of her unique perspective and academic and policy expertise as her academic and professional CV. She was born in 1977 in Afghanistan and lived as a refugee in Pakistan for 14 years. Rosala was awarded her PhD here at SOAS in Development Studies in 2015 for her dissertation, Local Governance in the Age of Liberal Interventionism, Governance Relations in Post-2001 Afghanistan. She had previously completed an MSc from University College London and had been a Yale World Fellow class of 2008. She followed doctoral studies here at SOAS up with two years of teaching at SOAS and then returned to Kabul, serving briefly as the Afghan President's Advisor on Local Governance and assuming the Directorship in 2016 of the Afghanistan Research and Evaluation Unit, the AREU. Now, capacity building has long been a focus of donor exertions in Afghanistan and is a particularly fraught and charged term which covers a multitude of sins as well as some virtues as Rosala's research itself has richly demonstrated. But there is no question but that the research capacities of Afghanistan have developed in a notable and formidable way and our speaker tonight is both a manifestation of that trend as well, of its, as, well as one of its principal architects. The AREU has emerged as a leading think tank and research institute in Kabul and conducts cutting research, cutting edge research across many fronts. Rosala is a frequent guest and commentator in UK academic policy and media circles, including Chatham House, BBC Radio 4, and the World Service, and The Guardian, for which she writes regularly on Afghan affairs. In the last year, Rosala has also played a key role in establishing and launching the £7 million Global Challenges Research Fund multi-institutional project, Drugs and Disorder, Dis in parentheses, Building Sustainable Peacetime Economies in the Aftermath of War, which is headquartered here at SOAS and led by my colleague Jonathan Goodhand, Professor of Development Studies. This project, underway for a year now, is exploring pathways of war to peace, economic transformation, and reconstruction in fragile and conflict-affected states, reckoning with the economic and social scope and significance of drugs production and trafficking, and looking comparatively at Myanmar and Colombia, as well as Afghanistan. Rosala is going to speak to us today on the theme, Connecting Citizens with the State, Changing Discourses, question mark, Changing Discourses and Programs on Community Development and Local government, uh, Governance in Afghanistan, which further extends the analysis so richly developed in her thesis. The last two decades have witnessed a phenomenal wave of internationally mediated and funded governance assistance to post-Taliban Afghanistan, much of it in the form of intervention at the local level. The consequence of all of that has been the unprecedented encounter or confrontation of the structures and dynamics of Afghan rural life 
with the Afghan state and the international donor, commu donor community as rural presence, presences and actors and factors and purveyors of ideas and practices. It will surprise no one to learn that none of this has gone quite to plan, but that's precisely what makes donor-funded local governance interventions a compelling object of study. The not necessarily contemplated or calculated impact that donor programs have had on local communities and civic identities and gender and power relations, the vicissitudes of implementation across all the intervening contingencies, the departures from script, prove to be more instructive than anything else. And I'm going to turn this over to Rosala in a second to guide us through them. But I would be remiss if I let the opportunity go by without making, begging your kind indulgence, a brief fundraising pitch. This Hyman Lecture Series has established its reputation as the most prestigious UK forum for an annual address on Afghan politics, society, and economy, but owing to the budgetary realities with which all UK HEIs must contend at present, the school will not henceforth be in a position to continue its support at current levels. The center is therefore turning to its public constituency, all of you who have come today and have so faithfully attended these last 16 years, to ask you to help us sustain this unique platform in coming years. There is a crowdfunding drive which you can access and contribute to, to from the Hyman Lecture page on the center website. And I would urge you please to consider making a donation, however modest. Finally, I'd also like to acknowledge the contribution of Taylor and Francis, redoubtable publishers of the redoubtable Central Asian Survey, to the event tonight, and of course to thank Jonathan and Jane Savory for all of their tireless organizational efforts. Rosella. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, what an honor it is to be here among all of you. Uh, perhaps, although not as a first Afghan to be here, I was having a conversation with uh, my dear friend, uh, Denise Kandioti, and he, she told me there were also other Afghans. Uh, Mr. Masum Stanikzai was here uh, in the past, but it's even a further honor to be here, probably standing besides being a daughter of SOS, I'm honored and humbled uh, to have that uh, um, uh, recognition, uh, but also to be here as uh, an Afghan woman standing and uh, uh, delivering this prestigious Anthony Hyman Memorial Lecture of the Year. Uh, during my studies in London, I have been a frequent participant of uh, this lecture series with distinguished scholars and have always learned with a wealth of scholarly work, uh, very rich discussions that followed it. I'm humbled to present my research and some of my reflections about what's happening in Afghanistan today, uh, with the hope that I also will contribute my share of understanding and knowledge with all of you. But as a still fresher to academia and to this world, I'm hoping that um, I'm confident I cannot compare with uh, distinguished scholars who delivered this lecture before. <laughs> I'd like to start with uh, thanking people who um, bring me to this point. Uh, there are many names, there are many friends in this room, but uh, I cannot um, uh, start my discussions without uh, acknowledging uh, Professor Jonathan Goodhand, my supervisor, and my mentor throughout the years of studies, particularly in the uh, final stages of my doctorate research, which I guess everyone knows how challenging it could be. Um, and also Professor Denise Candioti. Um, I always uh, consider you as my academic mother. I hope you accept uh, that. Um, um, sort of title on my side, and uh, someone uh, who has continued to give me moral support, something that I also needed as somebody who has no family members here and was going through all kinds of other challenges in addition to trying and struggling to focus to my studies and to my research. But somehow my background as uh, was uh, uh, introduced before I came to the stage 
can also give you a kind of an insight of what kind of a human being I am. I was here trying to focus and concentrate and study and um, sometimes disappear in the things that I was studying and confess to my professor that I don't know anything about anything, especially when I was reading Foucault, <laughs> you know. And in times, um, uh, being so depressed and so worried about the situation back home where most of my family at that time was living, uh, that it was very difficult that without systematic and without continuous support of the circle of friends and colleagues, I could uh, make this uh, 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 happen uh, to complete my studies. <coughs> so, Louis Dupree, um, uh, the late Louis Dupree, the well-known pre-war American anthropologist of Afghanistan, once wrote a metaphorical um, um, about a metaphorical mud curtain that surrounded uh, Afghan villages uh, and um, in a situation that the Afghan villages don't uh, prefer or don't feel comfortable with allowing outsiders to intervene or to get into those um, uh, communities and localities. What I have found um, in my research and in my studies was that the situation has changed significantly uh, since uh, those years, 1960s and 19, um, in, uh, earlier. Maybe in those years, um, Afghanistan's localities, Afghanistan's villages, were um, uh, surrounded by mud curtains that were not, I mean, this is a metaphor for the very tall, for those of you who, have been to who haven't been to Afghanistan, very tall walls that we call them qalas, or the qalas are sort of surrounding the, the localities and the villages and cases. Um, what I found in my research looking into the local uh, or village level governance was that uh, in the post-2001, particularly the years of uh, the post-2001 context, but specifically since the war in Afghanistan over the four decades, uh, this mud curtain has been torn apart. Afghan villages, Afghan localities are no longer those places completely protected and preserved from the outside interventions. And now when I talk about interventions, I don't necessarily um, limit my understanding to the, inter to the military interventions or invasions that are happening, but I also um, mean here um, different forms of intervention that in a minute I will come. In today's discussion, what I'm um, trying to, um, to highlight is the changing discourse uh, uh, on, uh, in programs on community development and local governance cases in Afghanistan. So, inspiring from those kind of understanding of Afghanistan back in the 60s, uh, I'm trying to sort of highlight what are the kind of changing discourses and cha changing realities of the country. In my analysis of studying this topic, I situate myself not only as a student of development studies, or as a researcher of development studies, but also as an Afghan insider, um, as a former refugee, or in that sense, a recipient of most of these interventions in my own life, and also as a grassroots uh, the leader trying to organize the re reception of these assistance and these interventions or resources coming through these re interventions in my um, communities and where I was leading. So, the reflections, the analysis in my entire sort of thesis is not simply a product of four years of spending time at SOAS in reviewing the literature and trying to figure out through the field research, but it is also directly linked with my life and my own sort of life uh, experiences. Uh, the continuation of which is also the case as I'm currently leading uh, a research organization who is focusing a lot on, uh, who has focused in the past and has been a resource for myself as a student and is now also focusing on these debates and discussions in the policy field. While studying Afghanistan and studying the local governance uh, relations there um, and the history of sort of interventionism, I'm also believing that the, the sort of these forms of analysis 
are not unique or they are not on the sort of the interests around it is not limited to Afghanistan. Particularly in my teaching experience, I found out that um, um, there are many similarities and there are many other venues, there are many other countries or contexts that they could definitely and easily try to connect and learn from the experiences that uh, we have in this country, in this particular situation. Uh, similarities are always, for sure, happening between different countries, but what makes Afghanistan's case most unique as a sort of a case study for many, many themes that um, have been sort of experimented there is the multiplicity of interventions happening at the same time, at the same localities, over the same people. And that really is something that um, goes simply, in my opinion, beyond uh, only limiting it to Afghanistan. So here, uh, I'm trying to sort of, um, by sharing my reflections and my findings from the research, I'm trying to sort of highlight this uh, connections or linkages between politics and the way politics works, development and peace building or state building. Uh, and I, uh, I have looked at uh, th these sort of linkages through the lens of looking at the sort of uh, post-2001 context of um, uh, local governance programs and policies that have been implemented um, and then uh, and how they have been formulated, how they have been sort of who, who were the actors involved in the formulation and the implementation of these programs and policies, and how that actually resulted into changing the local power dynamics. In terms of method, a more flexible, multi-sided approach helped me to really look into this um, uh, field because uh, arriving to a, a, a locality that I already was familiar to, I mean, not the specific lo uh, villages and districts that I have selected, but in general, being from Afghanistan, I was aware of the fact that um, I had to be a little bit more open-minded than going with a predefined questions and predefined hypotheses and try to test that. So my research was mostly um, qualitative. And so, in terms of um, uh, going to the uh, to the further to the research and what I found, I think uh, before moving further, um, I probably need to say when, when when I talk about local governance and governance, maybe very briefly, I can give you a sort of sense of um, what do we really mean by governance. What I mean um, is this: uh, uh, the tradition and institutions. Uh, by which authority in a country is exercised. So this is like one definition that covers both, both in my opinion, the state and also the non-state sources of authority. And that's really important to also consider the non-state sources of uh, authority, particularly as we are talking about these matters now, that we are not much uh, in a situation of, um, you know, a very clear, clear situation of where the state is and where the state ends, actually, in the country or it is authority ends. Um, and then uh, in my research, the focus on governance is, is more as a sort of in empirical reality rather than an ideal model that it has to be there. But this is my understanding of it. A lot of uh, practical donor communities and uh, a lot of you know, different uh, sort of actors on the ground probably had this idea about governance, particularly the term good governance, I'm sure most of you are um, sort of uh, uh, familiar with. Um, and so, uh, and also on the ground, another uh, confusion that exists is this uh, sort of um, uh, usage of these two uh, terms in a kind of interchangeably, the government and the governance, uh, and particularly talking about the lo local or subnational um, government. So of, uh, the distinction between the two is also important to note. And when I talk about go uh, local governance, uh, again, for me, it is a set of institutions, mechanisms, and processes by which people at the local level negotiate their interests, their needs, they mediate their um, differences, and exercise their rights and obligations. Of course, I borrow this from 
uh, uh, Lutz and Lender, but it's important to have a clear understanding of what do we mean by local governance we talk. So this is the definition I follow. And I borrow the term public authority, again, um, by using it in situations where people in or outside of the formal systems are using public authority in order to make decisions um, um, in, within the local level, um, contribute to local conflict resolutions, and also in order to set relations um, uh, with outside their locality. For example, somebody at the, at the village level, uh, the traditional village leader or the modern village leader, if they are separate people, they, use, they exercise public authority. They are not part of the formal government system or administrative system, but they are exercising public authority. So now probably, uh, and yeah, I think I mentioned before the inf intervening forces. When I say intervention and interventionism here, I have to also be clear that I'm trying to communicate uh, different uh, interventions by different groups. So it's the state intervention that comes through the programs and policies. It's the donors who either throw the state in non-states such as NGOs or intervening or directly they have programs, and it's also military interventions, a mix of military interventions that has happened in the period that I was conducting this research um, between 2010 and 2014. So we were still at that time under a very significant level of influence by international forces, and the provincial reconstruction teams were operating in the country, and so this whole line between development and security and and government was completely uh, blurred at that time. So looking into these kind of interrelations between governance, development, and that now these interventions happening in the form of programs, again, um, I find out that it is important to sort of use a kind of a more kind of a flexible lens to, to be able to understand rather than look, fitting everything in the uh, through the lens of liberal democracy and say, okay, here has to be good governance, democratic institutions and layers of governance that we have to move. Or following a kind of a political economy approach where you just get the sort of agency of people and how local people are uh, sort of uh, making their lives and making decisions and what kind of power relations they have disconnected from each uh, other. What I found is that within the localities, there is this tendency of uh, uh, sort of preserving their autonomy, but at the same time, the agency for ensuring their um, access to resources, the agency to ensuring their stronger relations with outside world is also like making them more sort of flexible. And in a minute, I'm going to give you more sort of examples to sort of uh, um, uh, uh, that are linked to this. Uh, so, before going to the examples, uh, what is generally seen, as I said before, is this huge gap that we see between uh, the Western sort of conception of governance um, in comparison to the, 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 what actually exists on the ground. And the ground relations are not necessarily uh, could be explained in the traditional or typical form of um, um, description that this is completely traditional. What I found uh, in, my, in, my, in my research is that it's more of a, uh, it's more of a complex power relations that forms or that reflects Afghanistan's localities or Afghan villages than, than simply um, it is uh, explained in a kind of a good governance forum of clear institutions, clear functions, and clear sort of authority uh, uh, that is um, sort of proposed. So now probably is the good time to sort of give you some insights on, um, um, I don't know, forgive me if I didn't go too much followed uh, the, the, the lens, but because of some definitions, I added some of the um, slides in there. So, um, to just give you an example here in terms of how these perceptions or these kind of conception, uh, conceptual understandings differ is um, uh, two villages were main sites of my, my field research in two, in two districts, uh, one in central 
Afghanistan in Bamiyan province, uh, the district of Yakaolang, and um, another um, eastern Afghanistan, uh, Nangarhar province, in the district of um, Behsud. And, and uh, interestingly enough, the district of Behsud is a large district that the Jalalabad city, the provincial capital of Nangarhar, is also located um, in, uh, in this uh, district. Uh, in both localities, uh, what was seen uh, uh, are lots of similarities in terms of the external intervention. So I looked at the National Solidarity Program, the NSP program, which is very famous uh, for community development, as one form of intervention by, uh, uh, by the government that is operationalized by the, um, or facilitated, as it was um, uh, explained, by the uh, non-governmental organization or the NGOs. Uh, as a result of um, this uh, formulation of this program and operationalization of it at the village level, what happens is that uh, the program initially enters the village uh, or introduced in a village for, uh, with the purpose of uh, bringing resources from the uh, from the local, uh, f uh, for the f public of, uh, service of uh, public uh, at the local level. Uh, and I mean, to go back to the sort of history of it, um, probably some of you in this room are more familiar than, than, than others, so I would not uh, go too much into detail, but um, um, one thing that is uh, very sort of commonly known now is that the main persons who have uh, contributed uh, in the formulation and designs of this community development program in appearance uh, and particularly according to the World Bank a very non-political program which has nothing to do with politics are now the two top uh, presidential uh, one is a president and another one is a, a, a top presidential candidate I'm talking here about current president uh, Ashraf Ghani and currently uh, presidential candidate, um, Minister Hanif Hatmar. Uh, mm, Hanif Hatmar was at that time Minister of uh, Ministry of Rural Rehabilitation and Development, and um, current president at that time was Minister of Finance. So both of them, under the uh, presidentship uh, or leadership of uh, uh, Hamid Karzai, uh, come up with this idea that they have to uh, formulate um, a program that basically bypasses the internal patronage political network at the provincial level and directly connects the village with the center. So that was the sort of idea behind it. Okay, the, the formal explanations may not say it in this way, but through you know, conversations and uh, sort of connecting the dots in terms of, you know, different narratives that were gathered. This is what we have um, sort of um, uh, uh, received. Uh, and so uh, the purpose of it was to deliver services at the local level, at the village level, uh, and at the same time politically connect uh, uh, villages with the center in a way of, you know, relationship of delivering services and then in one day hopefully sort of earning legitimacy from those localities. There was also another in a few years ago again in the same similar um, um, a series I remember a conversation and we had Arne Strand our good friend from from Norway who was also talking about another version of uh, um, you know another sort of narrative that was shared at that time that it was uh, the program, National Solidarity Program, started um, uh, before uh, Afghanistan had its um, first elections. Um, so there was also this practice of democracy being used as another objective of this. And the practice of democracy worked interestingly at the village level because for the first time probably at the village level there were like people from outside, these were not necessarily only the governmental people, they were like NGO workers, the non-governmental uh, crowd, and they were going to the villages, explaining rule of the game, explaining the rules for the elections and how, um, you know, um, all the village uh, should be divided into, for example, uh, clusters, and they all uh, set rules for the representation and vote everyone directly for one person and secretly for one person to have them as their 
uh, chief of the Community Development Council. So the, the institutional sitting at the village level was uh, introduced as CDCs or the Community Development um, Councils. Through these councils then the decisions were made based on you know criteria that they set within the council on how to distribute the resources and what programs to sort of implement and uh, what were the needs. First they would do a need assessment and then they would decide about prioritization and what kind of programs they should uh, sort of, or projects, sorry, uh, they should implement in their uh, localities. Now, um, these were sort of objectives. And then one particular uh, side of uh, NSP that makes it more significant at the particularly in terms of community development, but also in terms of, you know, the sort of political evolution of changes in the local power relation was its conditionality. The conditionality of the program, uh, which is uh, part of, uh, I mean, I so far explained to you as if this was a completely national program. Of course, it was operated at a national level, but the, the program was funded through a much broader scheme of the World Bank, known as Community Dr Driven D Development. And based on that CDD, or Community D uh, Driven Development, the, the World Bank was channeling funding to, to this program um, in order to sort of achieve uh, its goals. And the conditionality uh, part, although it is considered by some that it was a Western imposition on Afghans and so forth, but it wasn't that much. There were like a divisions of, you know, opinions between facilitating partners who were like mostly the NGOs, some of them strongly rejecting this and others trying to accept it. And the person who, or the individual who insisted most was one of the main political actors um, today who uh, insisted that uh, based on uh, based on his particular understanding of Afghanistan or as an Afghan he argued with the rest of the nationals and internationals in the team that this conditionality has to be there and without this conditionality the program will not operate in, in, in localities or in villages where women are not taking part and uh, the, the, the system was working in this way that, okay, in the elections, everyone will take part, but then the position of chief, chief CDC is given to, to um, men. Uh, the position of deputy uh, should always go to a woman. Or in particular, later on, they realize that in some localities, it's completely impossible. And then they say, okay, let's go for and rely on separate committees. But anyway, there, in, in the course of my research, I also come across lots of very interesting stories of how this operated on the, in realities and how some places which are still to this date considered conservative and considered a troublemaking spots within a province, within a, you know, uh, travel routes, they resisted and they rejected the idea of accepting the conditionality. But in areas that they have adopted in, in areas that they have adopted first or later or after they saw the development of one particular neighboring village, uh, there has been varying stories. So not every village at the same time automatically accepted this conditionality. That tells us a re reality that, okay, not everyone was simply re ready for their women to take uh, part in uh, village governance and village uh, decision making. But later on, it really um, changed. Uh, and so as a result, uh, community development councils were established in most uh, parts of the areas that were covered by the NSP program. The NSP program um, continued to operate in for 13 years, more or less. Um, and then um, uh, that really um, uh, was a program that uh, the coverage was nationwide. There were par probably a very, very small communities or uh, parts of the communities that were um, uh, sort of neglected and didn't get their uh, um, uh, the, the resources, but the, most of the country uh, managed to get it even till the very last phases of this program was implemented in different phases as well. So. Now I, I spoke about the community development councils and as one form of the uh, village uh, sort of intervention. I take you back to the village itself. So what really describes an Afghan village typically? A typical village in Afghanistan is, and I'm 
here sharing again like a kind of an anecdotal experience of arriving me as a researcher in a village with a list of you know different councils because I'm told that this village has a community development council, it has health council, it has education council, it has this council, that council, the other council, so too many councils. So I arrive in the village, this is the eastern village I'm talking about, and I look for who is the right person to um, sort of meet. And I meet a woman there, of course, as a woman, it's easy to, to, to communicate first with a woman. And she also is quite a, um, um, I should bring maybe instead of these, uh, uh, this is the Eastern village that I'm talking about. Uh, so I meet uh, this lady um, in the picture, uh, bottom picture. And I uh, try to explain to her, uh, to her, she at that time was the deputy uh, CDC. And she says, oh, you have to meet the, um, the, I said, well, find me the, who is the leader of the CDC and who are the sort of people um, that are uh, members of the CDC uh, or the Community Development Council. So he ta she takes me to the Malek's house and they say, oh, you're, you're talking about Malek type. Malek is the traditional leader. So we go and I start uh, my conversation with the, uh, with the Malik or the, um, the head of the, or the chief of the CDC and I start sharing my list of people that I want to meet, the head of the education council, the head of the health council and all the councils that I was heading in. He looked at me and says, I think you are looking for me. <laughs> I'm the person. <laughs> you are free to name any kind of councils. I'm the Malik of this village and um, just tell me what you need, what kind of information you, you would like to get and there is no other person, it's me basically. And so I really, I started, I said okay, so I had all these sets of questions, what should I ask from the head of the Maarif, Shurai Maarif or the Education Council and so forth. So in one way or form, I saw in this village a kind of a um, strong level of unity uh, the village was not um, uh, completely homogenous in terms of its tribal structure. Very challenging when you, um, when I say this and you have in your mind, but what about those um, Navy um, Academy who was talking about the tribes and every take a, it, it takes a tribe, this a, one, one tribe at a time or something like this was a title of it. So suddenly these tribes are described in literature as kind of completely homogenous that the Afghan localities, even in terms of the provinces, somebody once sent me an email and asked, can you tell me the provincial, the, 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 the tribal composition of each province? And I was like laughing and says, well, like forget about the provinces. We have 34 provinces, but we have over 35,000 between numbers are a bit mixed, 28,000 or 35,000 villages. And now you're telling me that I give you the composition of the, the, the tribal structures. What do you really mean? Like, because, I mean, you, you, I looked at one locality and there were like five, six, seven type of tribes. So the village was like, the, most of the men you see in there, they are coming from um, mainly two major tribes, Isak Zais and Ali Zais, both originally from south who have uh, been settled here historically very, very long time ago. Uh, but at the same time, uh, there were other uh, different uh, uh, forms of uh, communities within the village uh, f with different uh, tribal lineages, right? There were also people from different provinces living there. But uh, there was seemed to be a level of unity in terms of, you know, the, the elders uh, of the village who decided who should be the Malik and the Malik. Once the Malik was uh, agreed upon, and this has gone beyond the uh, intervention of the CDCs, and then it was very straightforward for the uh, uh, election process. They said, okay, we know who is our leader, and so for outsiders, they can label us anything, but for us, we, we know who is the, the main um, gatekeeper and the main person who is like uh, responsible for um, distribution of resources and channeling the the assistance of different forms coming to the village. So as a result, uh, the village also had influential uh, political figures living and residing there. For example, the head of the finance, um, uh, provincial finance ministry also comes from the same village and uh, a security uh, commander, a commander of some time, mostly the commander, when they call it a commandant, it's not like, not like a current military commander, but it's a 
commander of the wartime. Uh, also came from the, he was uh, serving in the border areas, uh, also from the same village and the mullah, so the village structure uh, and the main actors in the village were these people. The mullah, the commander, some of the political figures, some deputy minister was also from this village and also the elders. Uh, and not all of the people that I mentioned were part of the CDC. So they, they had some, some of the CDC members who, who were coming from the elite, but most of them were just ordinary, you know, uh, teachers or village, uh, um, villagers, basically, who, who sat under the leadership of the Malik. So this is like one example, and they also had um, uh, make sure that uh, uh, this lady who was the deputy uh, chief of CDC also has the deputy position. And although uh, she never uh, succeeded, she was fully supported by some of her villagers to become the chief CDC. But they said, for us internally, we are a very advanced village and it's fine, but we just don't know how this will work when we go beyond the village because somebody who comes, who, who takes leadership position in the village has to really deal with police chief office for with uh, in terms of you know criminal activities with you know different other groups so anyway in this form or shape what i try to say here is the internal village uh, actors and also yeah there was a religious scholar in this uh, village as well i think he is he is the second from the from the left with the turban not with the pakol but with the turban so he also is an interesting person. He also takes part in these kind of um, ceremonies. What you see here is um, a PRT, a lady from PRT, who are uh, just uh, inaugurating their uh, school. Uh, and the entire fundraising for this school through the uh, NSP project, uh, partly through the NSP, partly through the PRT, which is the provincial construction, uh, reconstruction team of the Americans. It was all fundraised by the deputy uh, CDC, this lady uh, who was there, Jamila John. So what happened uh, in this process, as you can see, is that the, the villagers did not let the woman, here is also a kind of a gender dimension in it, to be the leader of the village. But the woman was an active, she was an activist in her time even before the changes and after that, like be during the Taliban time, she was running a school. And after that, through the elections, she got into the councils and from the councils, from the local CDC council, she became also a member of the district development assembly and became a very active member of her community. In addition to doing these kind of representation, she was also more active in, in terms of her position as a woman, more able to bring in resources to the village. So practically the school that they have called, they call it, called it after their, their village name, Kalai John on Khan. So for, uh, and because she had her own agenda that the school should not only be uh, a boys' school, so the same building, uh, high school, uh, in the morning is Kalai, called High School of Kalai John on Khan, in the afternoon it's called the High School of Malika Suraya, Queen Suraya and it's used for girls. So the agreement is made that equally the, the building that is built as a result of this particular um, um, uh, intervention, it is also used um, in the afternoon for girls so that girls and boys in the village will have full access to education. Um, uh, some of you maybe by listening to me at, by this point will say like, so what is this, how is this linked to what is happening today? I'll come to that, but I thought it's really important to spend some time talk about villages. How much time we often, I mean, I, and I'm also, um, I have to confess here, um, I'm getting a bit tired of talking about peace and how peace is impossible and what is happening in Doha and who is having dinner with whom. So to me, it's really important to also come here and stand and uh, sort of um, also share this kind of reality in Afghanistan and how we can sort of better understand what is happening. So to sort of come back to this, the, the analytical sort of aspect of the, uh, what I explained in terms of a village, so what are the local structures, how they sort of take shape, and um, 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 who are sort of the main actors. Um, there are different, four different sort of uh, critical sort of components or categories that needs to be sort of considered. And these include, for example, the international actors and their objectives, 
because you can see that uh, a lady from PRT is in the picture uh, trying to sort of be there next to the man. And of course, we have also a female representative from the, uh, from the, uh, uh, from the village, a, a daughter of some, probably daughter of one of the uh, Maliks or someone uh, from the village elites uh, who is there. Uh, but that tells us the direct, the direct form of intervention at the very local level. So understanding the international actors, their objective and their, the resources they bring, the national level political elite who also have some sort of linkages, either lineage linkages of living there or residing there or coming from there, or kind of uh, linkages through people who are loyal to them. And then there are local elites who could be, you know, people with more uh, uh, land, people with more sort of tribal, the majority tribal um, or, or, or families that are staying there. They could be considered as local elites. And then the p local population that includes, you know, people at different, uh, in terms of economic status and in terms of social economic status at different le levels or layers. It is generally the recalibration of relations between these different elements that can help us to understand the shifts in the local governance relations over time. Uh, because, okay, not everyone you see in this picture who have mostly are the members of the CDC uh, were uh, the same level influential, the same level powerful as they are under this new form of intervention as they were before. Someone was probably having a government job, someone was having a private business, and not in a unified uh, way. The relationship they built within the village and also with outside. I was talking about the religious scholar, and he then, what happened to the same Malik, uh, the PRTs came and says, we are making some other shura it's, you know, a good shura and it has some money, salary also, because this is, they all are like volunteer uh, bases. And uh, just, uh, you know, pick one person from your village uh, and send it to the district council or maybe ideally, like if you p send two person, it will be good because a woman and a man is also good uh, to have uh, a male and a female representative at the district level. So the woman from the village was automatically the most powerful woman in the village. Uh, and for the male, the Malik he himself, uh, because he had a full-time job, he decides not to go, and so he sends the religious scholar. So the religious scholar becomes a member of the ASOP, the Afghan Social Outreach Program, which was um, a part of the Afghanistan stabilization program, but much more uh, initiated by... Um, by uh, by military, um, by ICE, uh, PRTs and the sort of the military uh, forces there. And that had a very different sort of objective and a very different form of working than the, the, the district development uh, assemblies and the CDCs or the community development councils. Because in both these councils, the objectives or the way it worked, it was very volunteer based, the funding that was going was through a very system of, of course, I cannot say that there was no corruption. Maybe there, ha there ha not maybe there must have been corruption of some form or another, but the system of accountability was very clear. The fu funding was not coming individually. The funding was coming to the council. They needed three signatures to get access to the funding. The chief, the deputy, the treasury, they all had to agree to get the funding, and it was coming through the very sort of open system. Whereas in the ASOP situation, I had to move from the village to the district to understand what was happening. And when I reached to the district, uh, the new district governor was in place. And um, so he said, yeah, the, council, the, the ASOP council existed, but I had to like, ask them to leave because they were intervening directly in my work. And I said, how comes? And he says, well, the, the process for selection of the district um, the ASOP, the military funded district council, was specifically organized in a way that the district governor was asked that you have to select some kind of, you know, members that you trust from your community, from your district, and invite them to become 
members of this ASUP council. So as a result, they were loyal only to the district governor. Now the situation becomes complex when the district governor is shifted, the new district governor comes, and they are not his buddies. So that's why that they, he had to like basically dismiss most of them. And also that program was experimental, so it uh, was stopped very soon. Practically what happens as a result of this is, uh, you know, for the villagers, it was a very strategic decision who to send where, how to attract resources, and how to sort of maintain also a kind of a neutral system between two different forms of intervention. One providing salary, the other is not providing, and so they said, okay, if I send anyone else from the CDC membership, I will cause a lot of trouble because people will start saying, how come he gets salary and I don't get salary? So they found a very you know, uh, strategic way of dealing with it. Um, um, so in terms of um, uh, my other experience, which was um, uh, Bamiya, I come across a very uh, sort of, uh, uh, in some ways, as I said, similar, in some ways, um, uh, a different experience. In Bamiyan, the village that, in Bamiyan, by the way, I have to give a very brief um, uh, sort of um, background of the, the, the two villages that I, the two villages that merged in order to meet the requirement of forming a CDC, a, a community development council, because on their own they were too small to form a CDC. So, and also historically the two villages uh, have the history or the background of being um, a victim of this very ma um, tragic massacre during the Taliban time. So a lot of younger generation, or mid-level at that time, then the mid-level, mid-age um, uh, generation of the village were no longer there, or the elderly, completely not. Very much younger, much younger people in their 30s and then their uh, 40s were um, residents of this village. Uh, and so two villages com uh, combined to form a CDC, and uh, there was one village uh, relatively s larger than the smaller one, and so they said, okay, if we are two villages and we merge to form a CDC, then we have to come up with a kind of arrangement who will be the chief of CDC, because anyone will vote for their own villager, right? So the, the, the larger village um, secured the, the position of the uh, chief CDC. Now for this smaller village, they had no choice but to have a woman to vote for. And this village is called Akhuntan. Uh, it's a village that um, a, a very influential uh, religious uh, leader who probably passed away in, in um, Najaf also comes there, the followers of the Najaf um, uh, um, uh, uh, side of the Shia population. So, um, and they also have a madrasa within the village uh, that they have uh, created. So the village is known for its madrasa and mosque and uh, a very large madrasa that is existing there. In, um, I will not bore you with the similar story of how they created, but this part was an interesting for me that in, this, uh, in, the, in the combination of two villages, because of the conditionality of the intervention from outside, they had to rely on a woman. And uh, the lady here with a notebook and glasses is the one who, is, um, who was the deputy CDC of the, uh, the two villages. And also, not only that, she also represented at the district level five villages from the neighborhood of where she was coming uh, from. So, gatekeeper basically for the entire resources regarding women's, uh, children, assistance to the villages, and uh, regard to women and children would come through this lady. By the way, I have to tell you, she cannot read and write. So I was just asking her, how come you are not reading and writing? You have glasses and you have a notebook and a UNICEF uh, a notebook and a pen. He says, it's fine that I don't write. Everything else is saved in the memory. And when numbers are discussed, I make sure whoever is sitting next to me to write the numbers for me. So I have no problem to read and write. In my arguments and my discussions, sometimes when people are mm, kind of uh, pitying for women in the rural areas that they are illiterate, they are poor, they are helpless, they don't know anything, when I go very strongly and I argue, I see uh, this kind of examples are coming to, to my head. Like, how can you say this woman is not empowered? She 
cannot, she didn't go to any school, or she cannot read and write, but she makes sure to make note of numbers. So she also make me write my phone numbers in the in the uh, in the notebook, and she showed me the notebook was full of numbers and says this is the budget for the chicken farm that we have. This is the budget for that. So fully fully functional and fully authoritative in her locality. Um, the photos are an issue, by the way, principally. So it's not that only this kind of meeting. In the mixed meetings, they, she also sets. But uh, I didn't feel comfortable taking a lot of photos. So I just have this very, like, and I told them I'm going to at least keep this for my uh, research. And uh, they, they agreed to, to have it in this way. Um, so at this stage, what, what I um, was um, kind of uh, trying to say here, uh, in this uh, uh, relation to the uh, village in Bomyan, similar process in terms of what happened uh, there um, in terms of you know overall processes. But one thing became an issue at the later stage. When the one round of election over, the second round of election, then the two villages did not, um, uh, did not agree on the same uh, uh, the CDC chief because the, they had to switch now and make the chief CDC from one village and the, 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 the deputy from the another one. So they, as a result, then here brings me to sort of a, a conversation on another form of intervention that was also happening. Um, and that is the, the policy interventions from, the, uh, from another institution in Afghanistan, in Kabul, uh, na named as IDLG, the Independent Directorate of Local Governance. Uh, up to now, I was talking mostly about the community development intervention, the mix of it with international militaries and how they are operating. So in situations where there are disputes and lack of unity within the localities, then there are also other situations that are linked to this that also provides people with taking sides in different you know, directions. And here, what happened in the Bamyan case was that because in the second round they didn't get along and they didn't have a, uh, an agreement or consensus on who should be uh, elected, they decided to um, uh, look for another solution. And that was to go and to register themselves, uh, to regi each village separate again, because they, jump, they, merged, they have two different names, two different histories. So they, 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 they separated again and they both to the uh, to one uh, department at the district level called the Mudiryate Qariyajat, like the village affairs the department, and they registered themselves, each one, each village, they registered a separate Malik, or a, 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 in the Bamiyan context, they are not called Malik, they are called Arbab, which is the same, the sort of local um, representative or uh, uh, leader. So Arbabs were registered there, and uh, the idea for Arbab registration, although at the center, no one from IDLG would confirm to me, but it was much more um, a kind of a, um, a, it was a form of a sabotage in terms of the village leadership, leadership ownership at the center level in terms of two institutions. So now the solution for the Bamyanis was, okay, we will have two separate Arbabs and we don't care about if tomorrow there is another rule, we will fit, but otherwise everyone goes their own way. Um, now, competition on the ownership of village um, uh, was mostly between IDLG and between MRRD, the two institutions at the center level. I have covered most of the MRRD story um, in terms of you know what happened and how what kind of developments were there. On the IDLG part, there was a different story in terms of its establishments. IDLG as an institution that I have looked at in terms of you know, um, the policies of subnational governance uh, was formed under, uh, around this particular narrative of you know, elections, the national level elections, the presidential and the um, uh, provincial uh, councils or the parliamentarian elections. And as a result, uh, someone who was leading IDLG um, at the time comes with an idea that, okay, give me a small group of people, uh, an institution with some level of authority over the provinces and districts, and you are just sure about the elections. And IDLG became more, um, significantly more involved in the elections of 2009, which was one of the first, of course, the 
as we move ahead, we had more troubles with more, more elections, but that was the beginning of um, what we faced. Um, and then as a result of it, um, IDG was formed uh, as a split between um, two, uh, from two ministries. The Ministry of Interior had a deputy ministerial on subnational affairs that moved to, uh, to this institution and one uh, part of the presidential office, which was taking care of the subnational or provincial affairs, also formed the IDLG. And the role of IDLG, one role of them at, at the subnational excuse me, provincial and subnational level, they have multiplicity of roles and functions, but one, their leadership uh, is different from the, uh, from the ministerial leadership because the minister has to take its approval from the parliament, whereas the IDLG directorate is directly reporting to the, uh, to the um, uh, president. In terms of the functions of what they are looking at at the village, uh, at the subnational level, they are taking care of provincial governor's appointment. They facilitated, of course, appointments are all done by, by, um, by the president himself. The appointments of the district governors, the appointments of the mayors, uh, and uh, the um, uh, provision of uh, support for uh, provincial councils. These are the main four sort of functions of um, IDLG. Uh, the institution historically and the formation of it, as I said, I can go into more details, but probably time will not allow. It was more uh, basically uh, a, a kind of a rather a conflicting sort of mission for the creation of this, which was uh, the perp uh, the perp for the purpose of uh, strengthening the sort of par uh, patronage-based politics, because the patronage-based politics will secure elections and re-elections of figures at the, at the national level. And it was used also, it was established for that purpose and it was uh, successfully used during 2009 elections and to some extent during the elections uh, that came after that. Um, I cannot say in the, uh, during the 2018 last years because the last year's election was anyway, we had parliamentary election last year, so, but then Generally, the function of IDLG uh, as an institution, although it was um, interestingly framed the way IDLG was funded by donors, because let's remember that it was not entirely a government funded, it was also a donor funded institution. Uh, the government officials will describe IDLG with the very nicely done uh, paperwork work tra uh, ex explaining that this is an institution were created for the purpose of decentralization. Uh, but then in the actual actions of the institution was actually re-centralization re and strengthening the patronage network. And the evidence since its establishment and particularly their role during the, um, during the, uh, the elections has sort of highlighted that uh, aspect of the role. So in some, um, my, uh, my sort of uh, uh, comments re regarding the, the, the sort of local or internal polit political relations in Afghanistan in general is this patronage uh, based uh, sort of political relations that are existing. IDLG functioned to secure the central power through, uh, uh, through their forms of intervention. ASUP that I gave example before at the district level is one example of it. Elections is another example of it. Whereas World Bank, the UNDP, have tried to use you know, a different form of more democratization and going through a very smooth process of elections and representation and equal distribution of resources across the country. Now, what I try to highlight here are, again, two, two sort of points that we had, uh, we started with earlier on. And that is this kind of conflicting agendas of the intervention forces um, in the country. Um, now, let's also remember that this kind of conflicting agendas or competing agendas, and in cases they are competing and others they completely contradict each other. One comes with the purpose of democratization and liberalization, the other comes with the purpose of strengthening the patronage network. If an international military uh, person comes at the district level and asks the district governor to bring their allies into a council and then pays them also a hundred and something dollar 
uh, not at the, under the name of salary. I'm very like precise to say that they didn't call it a salary, but I don't care what it is called. It is money coming to someone's pocket, transportation, uh, allowance, or whatever. So if they do that, what kind of messaging it gives people? Strengthening of the patronage-based relation, because patronage is what they are relying on. And the trouble with that patronage relations is that, okay, this governor, they bring their own loyals, the governor, the district governor leaves, the other one comes, and then what happens? There is another form of intervention that is also happening, and I um, probably that give that example. I don't know how much time do I have now? Good amount of time, or? Okay, right. So one form of intervention, and then I probably sort of, sort of try to, to wrap up. Um, I hope I didn't bore everyone with um, going long, but you know PhDs, they talk too much, and I also have a habit of talking a little bit too much um, in times. Another form of intervention I talk about, and then we will sort of close, uh, and that was the case in Bamiyan. Uh, I mentioned that the Bamiyan, uh, the village in the Bamiyan was uh, 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 rather uh, had a, a strong religious ties uh, with, uh, with Najaf. And uh, by my arrival uh, in this uh, particular locality, I realized that there was a construction going on of a very large uh, multi-floor uh, uh, madrasa. And they call it, uh, was a madrasa uh, downstairs on the top, a, very, uh, uh, a mosque uh, also, and then also a very large conference hall with a capacity of probably a thousand people in one hall. So I tried to sort of f figure out and find out from the local villagers uh, who is funding it, and then the response was very generic. Everyone that I met and talked to, they said, you know, someone very charitable contributed some money, and we built this. And at the same time, I was, you know, involved in building a school in another part of Afghanistan, so I knew very well in terms of costs of how much it, it costs to build such a large building. And I find out through my research that it was actually funded through the religious networks, and the religious networks from Najaf uh, uh, funded this much larger, with a much larger capacity of uh, 2,000 people or 1,000, some hundred people, uh, not very far away from another very large madrasa in mosque in the uh, probably 150 meters away from the same place. And that was called Madrasa Muhammad Yam. This was called Madrasa. Madrasiya uh, Khundan. Muhammadiyah is at the center of the, very close to the, uh, the district capital, but, uh, but they are not very, this, literally like 150 meters max, probably 80. And so, by learning about this fact that, you know, religious networks are also in, uh, interested in, 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 in having a presence at the village localities, then having that presence in the form of, you know, not only a mosque where people go, pre pray and go home, but also a madrasa, and the, the, the mullah of this madrasa that I met was a very bright, uh, intelligent, young Afghan man, maybe in his uh, probably mid-20s, uh, fully capable of speaking Arabic, English, Urdu, Farsi, uh, all th three, four languages, and the busiest person in the village because he says, I wake up and I start my day at four o'clock and I end it at uh, nine or 10, because I have classes of, I teach girls and boys English, I teach them Arabic, I teach them maths, I teach, because he had a, uh, a, a, his education in, um, in um, uh, he said in Pakistan and somewhere, but I don't know that how much of that was, um, because, and there are like in Pakistan also uh, madrasas for Shias, Shia um, students to go and study. So in some, um, to me, that part of the uh, learning or studying the village context was also very important. So I tried to make a comparison in terms of in estimations of how much funding has, ch has been channeled through NSP to the same uh, CDC uh, for two villages, and how much funding could estimatedly be spent on this large madrasa. And uh, my figures uh, kind of say that, okay, around 60 to 65 thousand dollars was uh, channeled through World Bank, and the whole building of this madrasa and the transportation of everything there, based on my estimation, was not less than 200 thousand dollars. And in a much shorter period of time, 
the madrasa and the building was completed and to this to this day that we talk i still see sometimes when i watch over some photos coming from the village i see that the the, the hall is the center of all events that are happening in yakaulang district particularly the martyrs day that when they do it to to commemorate uh, the martyrs day so um what I try to sort of highlight by these different forms of intervention is looking at these competing agendas over the same people, the same population, and how it is sort of changing the local power relations. So the person who was in charge of the building and construction of, construction of this madrasa was the same person who was also the chief of the CDC, the democratically elected, sort of democratically elected, but not constitutionally recognized um, uh, community councils, and in the same way, this is how the sort of the 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 sort of competing agendas are reflecting in an Afghan context. Now, to sort of look at it in terms of um, how this uh, um, relates to the larger question of separating uh, development from politics at the local level and its relations at the uh, uh, central level and even beyond that, then sort of then the regional and uh, international uh, levels, it's it's becoming very uh, uh, impossible to see it in complete separation from each other. What uh, and, and it takes me back to uh, to, to my earlier comments related to uh, the sort of interrelations with uh, between these two um, between these multiplicity of actors and sort of the way that they intervene that uh, uh, without sort of linking their interventions and looking at them all at the same time in the same places that has happened, it will be very incomplete picture of the country and the realities that we are. And in this conversation, I focused mostly on, um, uh, on uh, local governance and the way it is formed. Uh, the latest post uh, my research in between 2010 and 2014 uh, are that the NSP program is uh, uh, over and uh, uh, I maybe in the conversation and Q&A part I can cover some part of this what happened when that program was over on the ground and then the new program citizens charter for Afghanistan has begun uh, there is new now a policy uh, uh, um, for subnational governance uh, uh, or it is called the roadmap, which is 16 pages, very precisely explaining different layers of governance and so forth. So some development since then is happening, uh, but then uh, no matter what kind of um, future we are heading towards, uh, as we speak within, within the current context of uh, you know uh, peace talks and the changes, the elections that is happening, the presidential and um, a kind of a dozens of elections coming, I'm, I'm not saying the dozens of four elections are expected to happen at the same time. For the first time, there will be district council elections um, in July, all of them uh, promised for July. So within this new context that is emerging, uh, uh, there are lots of ambiguities, again, about these kind of relations that are evolving at the very bottom level in Afghanistan in terms of, you know, the legitimacy of these um, these structures that are created, particularly after the programs end, what happened to them during the program, who they are empowering and who they are disempowering. And then all these sort of, uh, at a much sort of zooming out level and how these kind of bargainings and uh, uh, debates between government and the armed opposition, or if we can call them Taliban, on, on how they con who controls uh, and who has more control over I uh, strongly disagree with the notion of control. I uh, would rather call it an influence. Uh, but uh, my explanation and the fact that this program has covered over, uh, over um, 99, almost 99% of the entire country, it tells a lot about you know, these questions of control and influence and uh, the role of state at the very local level. Thank you very much for your attention.